St. Quan's home for the ADD. Hey there, this is Quan3217 with episode 5 of Bring Your Own Calm. As for the intro, they can't all be failures. That gives a poor impression of what the Real Life Space Program is like. And since I'm a member of the Real Life Space Program, I want you guys to have an accurate view of it. Sure, the explosions are cool, but most days, we hardly blow up any rockets at all on most days. And so here we have, we're planning the perigee kicks and the apogee kicks to get all these nice trefoil orbits into nice three parallel circular orbits. What we really want is three spacecraft at the three points of an equilateral triangle. And so you can also see CurbNet going like crazy. And now the artificial comet is helping us out. The artificial comet is going to hold on to calm when everything else has lost it. And here we are ready for the paracurb kick that's going to put Yoke 2 into its transfer orbit. But we still got a couple seconds, so let's play around with this curb net. So, this is only a feature of the probadobadobadobadobadobadine. I guess this is what they put on the probe body instead of batteries. The SETI guys make much more useful probe bodies, but they don't have access to this curb net. So we're going to have a look at it while we're still down here in a low orbit and see if this will tell us anything that it's not telling us from a higher orbit. And it doesn't look like it is. So, and anyway, it's time to fly. And as always, I overdo it on the maneuver and end up having to point retrograde because I never include RCS on these things. The wheels are good enough for, uh, for pointing, and you really do only need one in if you can point any direction you want you really do only need one engine but it takes a while to turn around and this might be something that i'll have to deal with in in future versions but here we got this nice trifle orbit when each one reaches the top it'll fire its apogee kick motor and they will all be perfectly evenly spaced right well i guess if they all reach it at exactly the same time they will but I'm sure they're not going to, because if they could, they'd all have to fire at the same time, and I'm not good, that good at control. So we may not have perfectly positioned our constellation, even though we've perfectly positioned all the transfer orbits. Well, we'll just have to see how that goes. We'll plan the kick maneuver for for yoke two here, and the kick maneuvers for the others have already been planned. We don't have them all in the alarm clock. I'll have to go back and do that. But yeah, we get to do the fiddly bits with the wheel it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I wish I had a box that I could type a number in. I mean, you could even have a box that would say, "I'm targeting this apoaps. Figure out what prograde it'll take to get it." Yeah, that, that might be a mod that would actually add too much power to this thing. Okay, so we'll get this set up and we'll get this alarm clocked and we'll come back when it's time to do the next thing. And here we are with X-Ray making its first and only kick maneuver. So, real spacecraft, like I said in previous episodes, they got this weak little wimpy tiny about the size of an ant motor. It's got 100 pounds of thrust. That's a pretty standard thing. Um, the spacecraft will have a 100, 100 pounds of thrust motor. And it can't do the whole apogee kick close enough to apogee for it to make sense. So what they'll do is they'll break the apogee kick maneuver into several maneuvers. One of the previous projects I worked on, it would it was supposed to split the apogee kick maneuver into about five maneuvers and each of them took about 25 minutes each. We had trouble in the first one. One of the things that seems to always happen on these spacecraft is that they have various limits and red boundaries and things that are supposed to keep the spacecraft safe from itself. 
And what always happens, even from the time of Apollo 5 at the first unmanned lunar module test, they'd set the limits wrong, and they'd get up to space, and something wouldn't activate it quite as quickly as they'd expect, and the automatic maneuver would fail. The automatic maneuver would say, hey, something's not right, this isn't what I expected, and shut itself down. So on both the original lunar module and on my project, they had an engine that just didn't build up thrust like they expected it to. And so it, they turned the engine on, and one second later when they checked the accelerometer, it said, well, I got about 80% of what you expected, but I don't have the 100%, so that I'm out of limits, and i got to shut it down. And so on the lunar module, it's just because the engine wasn't modeled right. On my project, it was because there actually was a problem in the engine, and it just wasn't giving as much thrust as, as expected. And so in that case, it was probably a good thing that it was shut down on its own, because otherwise it would have taken a lot more fuel than it would have in order to get it there. Now that we're up there on orbit, they figure that the mission has about 200 years worth of fuel to keep it on station in its geosynchronous orbit. So, look at that comet way the heck out there. Okay, and so our first thing is in a carbosynchronous orbit. I wear my sunglasses at night so I can, so I can. Apologies for the camera work here. I'll, I'm still new at this YouTube thing and I'll try and make sure to, to keep you guys in mind when I do things. Also, X-Ray 2 and Yoke 2 both hit Apogee at the same time, which is good and bad. The good news is that means they're going to be at the corners of their triangle like they're supposed to. The bad news is they both want to maneuver at the same time, and well, they can't. So we're here at X-Ray 2 right now. We'll do its maneuver. And if you look really closely, Yoke's time is already passed. We'll get that as soon as we can. And now Yoke 2, the Kerbosynchronous Stay Out Home Twin, is getting ready to do its Apogee Kick maneuver. Now what's going on here with the vector is kind of interesting. So I did my best to point exactly at the blue vector, but the nav ball just isn't really precise enough. You can't zoom in, and I wish there was a better nav ball. And so if you're a little bit misaligned at the start, so you've got two vectors that are almost parallel, but then you do the burn, and you go along one vector, and when you get out to the end of your maneuver vector, the only vector that's left is from where you were where you are to where you're supposed to be well now that's all the way off to the side specifically because you burned off all the part that was parallel and so this always happens where the maneuver vector seems like it escapes it gets it gets repelled away from the direction that you're pointed and it gets further and further and faster and faster the closer you get to the end of the maneuver and so sometimes you'll see me chase it and sometimes you'll see me not worry about it but that's life. I imagine that the real spacecraft have to deal with this too. In fact, I know that they do. What they do is they perform the maneuver as scheduled, and then they do a trim maneuver afterwards. So what you'll hear the lunar module pilots talk about is that the burn was good, and that there was a certain amount of residuals, and that they did or did not trim them afterwards. So here's our constellation, but let me tell you, that is a sad, starry state for a geosynchronous constellation. The uh, One of the spacecraft should be right over the Kerbal Space Center, and look how far it is. It's almost to the horizon, and that's not an equilateral triangle. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a maneuver in here. We're gonna, we figure we're about an hour or so off, so we're going to put ourselves into an orbit that is an hour or so longer. We'll leave the periaps where it is at geosync but we'll lift the apoaps up as far as is needed in order to get that uh, correct period. We'll let it go around one and then reverse back into the uh, Kerbosync orbit as appropriate when we get there. Well, that's starting to look better. That's more, in fact, if we could stop right there, that would be a perfect equilateral triangle. But of course, that's the wrong altitude. So it looks like we overcorrected ourselves a little bit here.
and then from here we'll get ourselves back down into a Kerbosync orbit and we'll worry about tuning it up at another time. You know, what they do with the real Geosync satellites since they don't have these huge engines and these huge fuel tanks that we have here, they don't bring their last stage along with them, they have to do it a little bit at a time. So they'll change their orbit so that it's just a couple of minutes different period from Kerbosync, from Geosync and let it drift around and around until they finally get it to where they want. And, you know, that might have been what we should have done too, and that's probably what we will do with the other two when, once we figure out what their, what their proper position is. And since we overcorrected, we're going to bring it a little bit back in, and not quite to Kerbosync. Although, I should have brought it within Kerbosync because we need to go forward, and this is going to keep drifting us backwards. Not as fast as it was, but it's still going to be an issue. See here, Satellite 1 has gotten so far out of position, it can't even see Satellite 3 in, anymore. The horizon's in the way, and furthermore, it looks like Kerbal Space Center is right in the way. So we'll have to bring that down even further inside in order to get this trimmed right. And since we're now about an hour or some behind where we're supposed to be, we'll bring our orbit period so it's about an hour and some less than Kerbosync. And that will get us back in in one orbit. Yes, I know, I don't have any patience, but there we go. And so with that, we should be able to wait for it to drift around and gradually get back into position. Now we have visibility again, and we're getting back towards on station. It's looking good, it's looking good, and yep, that's, whoa, pushed the wrong button on the time acceleration. So let's let it go around again, we gotta have it completely lap both the other spacecraft. It's a good thing we don't need to control any of these things, because right now we can't. Right now all three of them are on the back side. And so now we're back into contact. And we'll slow down again. And pass it. Well, let's try again. It's a good thing we don't have to pay Kerbals, because we just wasted 37 days in time. So, if we were paying them salaries, we would have just wasted a month in salaries. Well, we'll get this thing back into position. Now, two and three are in sorry state, but we can fix those later by pretty much the same method. We throw one so that the one that's behind into a lower orbit so that it catches up, and the one that's ahead into a higher orbit so that it slows down. And then once we get them all into position, remember it's not the altitude that matters, it's not the periapse or the apoapse that matters, it's the period. If we get the periods to exactly 15, 5 hours, 59 minutes, 9.4 seconds, it doesn't matter if they're close to circular. They will stay put. Thank you to body gravity. And now from our position up on the high, we can check out the curve net again. Kerbal synchronous orbit isn't really a great spot sur for surveillance. Um, you get a good a good field of view, but you get a poor resolution being so far away. If we really wanted to spy on those nasty blue Kermans living on the other side of the planet, we'd have to put a low satellite up. Well, we could do that, but the good thing is there aren't any of those nasty blue Kermans or red Kermans out there. Better green than red, right? So we go and we're going to check out these things that are down there. We got a couple of mystery points that we'll go and have a look at. We'll record those as waypoints and then once we're able to fly planes, we'll go ahead and fly out there. So I've decided to spare you guys all the trim maneuvers, but that is a good looking constellation. We're almost directly overhead the Kerbal Space Center and we're almost equal distance away from 1, 2, and 3. 
So we'll go ahead and we're going to park each one of these in their optimal sun gathering position. Since I only put solar panels on one side because I was short on parts, what I'm going to do is point them all so that they point at, the, point at one of the poles and that they have their solar panels on the correct side of the spacecraft. And we'll rearrange them all like that, we'll put them in SAS, we'll let them sit for a little while, we'll time accelerate to freeze their rotation, and then go on to the next spacecraft. And that'll wrap it up for this episode. This has been Quan3217 saying, if at first you don't succeed, fly, fly again.